morning, everyone. Thanks so much for joining us today for the uh, webinar on financing Colorado's investment. This is Carol Hedges, the Executive Director of the Colorado Fiscal Institute, and I am just really thrilled and appreciative um, uh, of uh, the time that both uh, Trini Rodriguez and Dee Weiser have devoted to helping us all better understand some of the financing tools that the state of Colorado has uh, available uh, to, to finance the investments in uh, all kinds of public infrastructure, but particular with a particular focus on transportation. As we all know that uh, public investments build the thriving communities that we all want to live in, and better understanding the tools that are available to finance those investments is what this uh, webinar is all about today. I want to introduce both uh, Trini and Dee. So Trini, um, in addition to being a member of the Colorado Fiscal Institution Institute Board of Directors, is the Senior Vice President, Managing Director, Public Finance at DA Davidson um, and Company. He, uh, before joining DA Davidson, he was the Senior Vice uh, VP at uh, George K. Baum. Not only does he do cool uh, work and get paid for it, he makes incredible investments uh, of time and energy to, to our community. He's the Chairman of the Downtown Denver Partnership. He's the past Chair of the Denver Housing Authority. He is, uh, uh, and also is a member of the Rose Community Foundation Board of Trustees. Also with uh, uh, Trini this morning is uh, Dee Weiser. Dee is an attorney with uh, Butler with Butler and Snow, uh, where he focuses his practice on public finance. Um, in addition to the work that he does at Butler and Snow, he was recently elected and is serving as the president of the National Association of Bond Dealers. Um, which I know keeps, keeps him in Washington and out of Denver a lot, which is probably good for all of us. No, I'm only kidding. Um, uh, Dee also serves on the Denver Public Schools Foundation Board along uh, with a whole bunch of other kinds of community activities. Both of these gentlemen have, are really generous with their time and energy um, and really do all kinds of important things to make our community a better and stronger place to live. So thank you so much to both of you, and I'm going to turn this over to you now, and let's jump into the webinar. It's our pleasure. Um, this is Trini Rodriguez, and uh, we uh, are excited by the participation. Welcome to the to the webinar. Um, a couple of quick reminders you'll see on on your screen. Uh, please keep your phone or microphone on mute, please. And uh, instead, in order to submit questions, type your questions through the chat function of Zoom. Uh, you should see a chat window that allows you to to add questions. And we will, uh, to the extent you know, we can certainly handle everything, uh, any and all questions we receive. So the, as Carol uh, very well said, uh, Dee and I are gonna spend our time talking about some of the tools that are available to the state of Colorado to finance infrastructure and in particular transportation. So uh, I, you know, we talk about this as bonds, notes, and COPs, oh my. Um, it's uh, you know, the litany of, of uh, acronyms and other things that we use in public finance to talk about uh, these financing instruments. So real briefly, the agenda we'll cover this morning for our prepared remarks are a little bit of a capital markets overview, um, Colorado financing for transportation tools, and finally, uh, to the extent we haven't handled any questions uh, during our discussion, open it up for additional Q&A. Um, so on to uh, you know looking at the market. Uh, this chart shows you that you know really short-term and long-term treasury rates are expected to to rise in places and stabilize in others. Um, that really uh, the the chart shows you that from today through the first quarter of 2019 and the um, in the early years of a, of treasury maturities, we're expecting to see uh, about 10 to 13 basis points of increase for the two year and the three year. And as you get further out, you see greater uh, projected stability of long-term borrowing costs. So for a 10 year uh, benchmark treasury, you know, really only about a five basis point increase over the next year. And, uh, and you know, really only a one basis point increase on the 30 year long bond. Um, so so uh, a lot happening in, in interest rates, but continued um, long-term rate Stability. Um, the next slide shows you um, that unique tool for financing uh, that's available to states like Colorado, the tax-exempt borrowing costs, 
um, over time. This is a presentation of the yield curve as it has occurred since the early 80s, 1981. And as you can see, the vertical line shows the range in which rates at each maturity have uh, uh, fallen uh, since that time. And the blue squares show uh, where we are today in terms of borrowing costs. And uh, the, I think one of the key points here is while we're not at the very lowest rates that we've seen over that uh, long time period since 81, we are not far higher, too far above it. Um, with the bottom of the line representing the lowest point um, for borrowing costs for those maturities. Um, so on to the, the real meat of our discussion here. That, that was really intended to provide you context. Um, on to the real meat of our discussion here, we wanted to talk about some of the pledge and security structures that are available to the state. And uh, I am you know, here principally to talk about the financial aspects of these um, uh, structures and D uh, will absolutely give us a lot of insight on um, the, the legal framework that's involved in each of these types of uh, borrowing structures. Um, so the first one, transportation revenue anticipation notes, really is a uh, tool that uh, the state of Colorado has used in name um, going back to uh, the early 2000s, um, having uh, financed um, the major uh, I-25 corridor project with transportation revenue anticipation notes. Um, and the, uh, that financing tool continues uh, to be available in concept. There are a lot of legal uh, constraints and frameworks to, to uh, consider with respect to transportation revenue anticipation notes. The biggest one that I think um, you know, we'll hear a lot about is the need for voter approval to incur that type of indebtedness. Um, at the moment, um, you know, and you'll see this in a moment, we are financially projecting that to be among the, the lower cost borrowing options available to the state in terms of lowest interest rate. Um, enterprise revenue bonds is a, another category of, of financing that's available to the, to the state, uh, mainly through its um, high performance transit, uh, transportation enterprise, HPTE, um, uh, and through uh, various vehicles it has available to it. Um, and uh, that in, you know, really relies on essentially tolling and uh, so, so financing the repayment of, of obligations through revenues such as tolling um, revenues. And then the next category, dedicated tax revenue bonds, would be you know, establishing uh, some uh, identified uh, individual tax revenue source that is uh, made available to the repayment of a long-term uh, financing or a dedicated tax revenue bond. This could well be a sales tax. Um, it is also among the lower cost borrowing alternatives uh, that are available to the state given the strength of the credit worthiness of a, of a sales tax revenue stream um, in the state of Colorado. And that also, I think we'll hear from D on multiple fronts, has the requirement to uh, to receive voter authorization to incur that type of indebtedness. Going back to enterprise revenue bonds, that has the unique possibility um, of not requiring voter authorization. Um, close the loop on that point. Um, and then finally, uh, certificates of participation is the, the last kind of major bucket of possible financing sources for the state. And certificates of participation really rely on a lease financing structure. Um, revenues can come from a variety of sources, including the general fund or um, other identified revenue streams. And this is a, yet the, the second of the, of the four that is a unique um, borrowing tool that has the ability to uh, be incurred without voter authorization. And I'm going to pause there and turn over to Dee to add in on the um, other bigger considerations as well. Thanks, Trini. A good overview. Um, <clears throat> I'll dive down into the weeds a little bit uh, from a legal perspective. In fact, go back to uh, statehood, which was 1876. 
contrary to popular view, I was not around at that time. <laughs> but um, uh, our Constitution, as originally adopted in 1876, has a provision in Article 11, Section 3, which effectively prohibits um, the state of Colorado from incurring a debt. Important. Uh, but our Supreme Court um, has interpreted that in a way that there are financing structures that comply with that constitutional provision. It would include what's known as special fund bonds, which would be bonds payable from a specific uh, project revenue source. So, for example, an institution of higher education might issue bonds uh, payable from. Also, uh, any obligation that matures within the same fiscal year um, is accepted from uh, that provision. Um, thirdly, the Supreme Court decided in a case in the 1930s that the monies, in the, the monies from the gas tax that are dedicated to a special fund under the Constitution Then uh, lease purchase agreements, uh, which are subject to annual appropriation, uh, are also uh, exempt from that provision. And that really relates to Trini's slide here about certificates of participation. What happens is uh, the state would enter into a lease purchase agreement to acquire a piece of property. That lease is subject to annual appropriation. No debt is created represent the securities that are sold to the marketplace from the revenue stream under that lease purchase agreement. Final exception to Article 11, Section 3 is uh, that the state can create independent legal entities that might issue uh, obligations of their own. Think about the Colorado Housing and Finance Authority or the Colorado Education and Cultural Facilities Authority. Both of those can borrow money without voter approval. Uh, but they also don't really have any state revenue stream. They have their own independent revenue stream. So fast forward to uh, 1992 when I was around, um, and uh, uh, of course the voters. But just in diapers. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. I, I might have been changing diapers. But, uh, uh, but uh, in uh, in 1992, the, the voters in Colorado passed Tabor, uh, and the, the fundamental Tabor rule is multiple fiscal year financial obligation has to go to the voters uh, for approval. Uh, now, exception under, uh, under Tabor are kind of similar to these exceptions uh, in Article 11, Section 3. For example, as Trini mentioned, enterprise revenue bonds can be done without voter approval. And so, uh, high performance transportation enterprise is one that can do that. There's also the Colorado Bridge Enterprise. Faster surcharges we all pay when we register our cars uh, and other motor vehicles, and, um, and uh, also the exempted from Tabor's voter requirements, the refinancing of debt at a lower interest rate, and again the courts have determined that purchase agreements subject to annual appropriation, uh, where certificates of participation have been issued to investors, are also exempt. So when you take these two things together, Article 11, Section 3, and Tabor, uh, we can still do these transportation revenue anticipation notes, but we have to still have a statewide vote. We have to be subject to annual appropriation to avoid the debt prescription of Article 11, Section 3. And so this is exactly what happened with the trans that were issued. Um, I-25 uh, South project that Trini mentioned earlier. Uh, after a successful voter approval, but still subject uh, to appropriation. So I think maybe we should answer a couple questions. Yeah, we've got a good flow of questions. I think one of the uh, key ones here is uh, the are, does the state have any outstanding COPs for transportation currently? And the answer to that is yes, but not in the way you might think. Um, the COPs that are outstanding for transportation 
uh, right now in Colorado, actually, were used to finance the headquarters of the Colorado Department of Transportation, uh, as opposed to a highway facility or something along those lines. But maybe, Dee, you can comment on what the compatibility is for uh, for highway improvements. Right, uh, good point. And the, the issue here is an asset that an investor could actually foreclose upon if it was ever not appropriated on the rental plan And so it's going to be hard to foreclose upon a public road um, and keep people from traveling on it. Uh, but the way that might happen, and in fact, what is was contemplated in seven, which passed in the last legislative session, is that the state would sell other assets, buildings. So, Simple example, they would sell the Capitol building to investors essentially and then use that to make annual payments to companies with different capital building back. Um, maybe that's a stretch in terms of what the legislature would do, but at least it's an example of how it could work. Might be Jeff Bezos' next house if it were <laughs> ever needed to be sold in foreclosure. Yeah, that's right. Like that. Yeah. yeah. Um, on to our next uh, topic. So we wanted to provide a, an economic uh, comparison or an, a sense of how these uh, financing tools stack up. And I had mentioned that um, trans were among the lower cost uh, financing options from an interest cost perspective. Um, and the uh, this uh, slide actually shows the relative interest cost and interest rate cost differential between a trans issuance with a hypothetical credit rating of uh, AA2 slash AA versus a certificate of participation, which would have, we are saying, has a hypothetical credit rating of AA3, AA minus. Um, those credit ratings are, uh, very important to understanding the uh, to, to developing uh, financing and and locking down an interest rate for either of those types of financings and you'll see in this table that in summary terms uh, the trans financing using the same revenue stream uh, is more economical to the state um, to the tune of approximately uh, 0.14%, um, which is the difference between the 2.82% arbitrage yield, which is a, in effect an APR, or annual percentage rate, and the 2.96%, 2.964% uh, that is associated with the COP. These have, both have the same um, borrowing term, um, 2038, uh, is the final payment, um, and uh, but but the cost goes up for a COP as a result of a lower credit rating. I should also point out that the COP is also based on you know in developing this hypothetical credit rating um, is also based on the same type of revenue stream that a TRAN would be paid back from, and uh, the rating agencies have historically looked at COPs as one rating notch lower, so that's why you see a two there after the double A and a minus there after this capital double A, um, uh, one notch lower than a similar similar credit um, without the risk of annual appropriation. You know, it's, it's interesting though, Trini, because the, there is the risk of annual appropriation on the trans because of the Article 11, Section 3 problem I mentioned earlier, um, but I, if this does reflect how the market views it, that somehow it's different, right? Exactly, exactly. Yeah, no, that's a great point. And I would say also, uh, to the extent we, you know, the state is, uh, you know, more, cre you know, even more creative outside of what it's done in the past, these, this actual relationship of credit could change depending on, you know, the nature of what gets put into the trans. A question that came in that we should, uh, a touch base on here, and, and I think maybe people didn't hear me before about this, but the question was about Senate Bill 267 from last year. Yes, it did authorize uh, COPs for transportation purposes, uh, but um, as far as I know, those have not been issued today. My understanding as well. 
the uh, uh, moving down this chart to, to uh, talk in more dollar terms, um, they, this, these are both hypothetical financing uh, scenarios um, totaling about three billion dollars in financing amounts, so three billion dollars in funds to put into a three point five billion, excuse me, uh, as you see under the, uh, the row bond proceeds, three point five billion dollars of proceeds to put into projects, improvement of highways, expansion of highways, etc. Um, with a total interest cost of, um, you can see, 1.827 billion for the trans and 1.845 billion uh, for the COPs. So the COPs have a higher interest cost by almost 20 million dollars um, over the total repayment term. Um, the average annual payments, um, as a result, if you think of this as your mortgage payment. A higher interest rate mortgage will have a higher uh, monthly and annual payment, and that is borne out here in about a $2.4 million higher annual payment. So the state comes out of pocket um, at a slightly higher cost for using COPs under this type of uh, uh, set of assumptions and scenarios. The Next slide, uh, this just graphically presents the relative interest rates over the borrowing terms of the uh, COPs and trans that we talked about in the last uh, slide. And this is relative to the benchmark uh, borrowing rate or yield curve in the tax exempt market, what we call the AAA, meaning the highest credit rated MMD, which stands for Municipal Market Data Index. So that yellow line is really the lowest cost borrowing line. The blue line shows the trans interest rates over the borrowing term, slightly higher than that MMD, and the trans, uh, or in, and the COPs, the green line being the highest cost uh, presented over time in this slide. I think um, you know, if, you, if you reflect on what the state could do now for transportation and financing, uh, we could do the trans, uh, but that would be subject to a statewide election. Uh, we could do uh, some sort of enterprise financing, uh, but that probably means something like tolls uh, or, again, using the bridge enterprise if, if there was a qualifying bridge project involved, um, uh, or um, doing the lease purchase certificate of participation arrangement which is contemplated uh, by Senate Bill 267. Um, and finally, maybe public-private partnerships. Um, uh, the, the state has just executed one of those on the central I-70 project, uh, which has a little bit of several of these components to it. There's some uh, tolling involved, there's the bridge surcharge involved, and I think there's some annual appropriation risk uh, that the private um, uh, consortium has taken there, uh, but those are those are all the legal choices I think. But um, again, we'd have to have a statewide vote on the trans. Everything else would not require a statewide vote. But then you get to the question, Dreamy, right? Of is there a revenue stream? Is there a new revenue stream that's being added, or are we using some other revenue stream that's currently being? spent on something else or maybe dedicated to something else. Yeah, and that's the key question, I think, uh, on many levels, and Dee, I'm glad you raised that. Um, the key ingredients for all of these issuances, if some type of authorization is required, that authorization has to be available, and you've talked about that very eloquently. Uh, but secondly, uh, you need money to pay all these back. <laughs> None of these is a form of a grant. Um, and what is that money going to be? Is it going to be existing, some new uh, revenue stream? For example, we have heard over time, you know, the, the states have traditionally used and relied on um, gas taxes. And so, yes, could the state have a conversation about increasing the gas tax or some other type of uh, specific ownership tax? We need some incremental source of revenue, whether it's carved out of existing revenues or created as an additional one in order to support the repayment of whatever financing the state takes on. Um, in terms of other states, as we look across states, um, the, the 
choices run the gamut. Um, states uh, have their own preferences for their own types of uh, tax and, and uh, fee um, type uh, tools that they are supportive of, that they have appetite for. Um, a lot of that's influenced by state financing regimes as you cross state lines. Some states have a statewide sales tax, others don't. Um, some have a, a no income tax, some states have no income tax. And, uh, all of these influence, you know, really what states use. And so we actually see, you know, a wide range of different financing methods and, and revenue methods for supporting transportation uh, costs and burdens. Um, many, many states do use, uh, to the you know, extent they can, uh, general fund revenues, which largely in many states comes from uh, the broadest tax revenue sources, such as income tax and uh, personal income tax, corporate in income tax at the state level, uh, together with um, together with um, sales tax or another you know similarly broad source of tax revenue. I think one thing to point out on this is those a lot of those states have a unique tool that is uh, currently not available to the state of Colorado, which is a broad general obligation pledge. And uh, Dee, I know, can comment on that from a from a uh, from a legal perspective, um, and and sort of uh, you know history of, of why we don't. Um, but but also, but on, from a financing perspective, that is typically viewed as the highest and lowest cost way and most flexible way for a state to borrow. And that uh, indeed is a is a common tool that's used in many states for um, financing transportation which has, uh, when you think of the transportation network, is similarly broad and touches every single person in the state. So you like to have the financing and the broadness of the financing and the revenues that pay it back, you know, somewhat related to you know, the projects that it is going to go to fund, but turn, yeah. turn yeah. it over to you. No, that's right, uh, Trini. Um, you know, a number of states do general obligation financing, and it is the lowest cost borrowing for them. Um, but again, going back to the Constitutional Convention in 1876, the, for whatever reason, our founders made the choice that the state of Colorado shouldn't be able to borrow much of anything. It, it wasn't that they said you have to have a vote, it was just you can't do it at all. Um, whereas at the same time, they authorized local governments, to in fact, in Colorado, to in fact do general obligation financing so long as they had a vote. So there, for, for whatever reason, the founders made that distinction, and it's what we are living with today. Um, going back to the gas tax, you know, we haven't raised the gas tax in Colorado since 1991. I think the same is true at the federal level, uh, but we're now seeing states around the country to address the massive infrastructure needs they have in transportation are in fact biting the bullet, raising the gas tax. I think the last time we did this, Trini, I, I said, and maybe surprised some people, I, I think under our laws, the gas tax isn't a tax at all. It could be recharacterized as a fee. Uh, we have some court cases that support that, including the most recent uh, Bridge Enterprise key fee case. Uh, and so the legislature, if they wanted, could recharacterize the gas tax as a fee or impose a new fee similar to the to the faster surcharge and not have to have a statewide vote, uh, but um, obviously a lot of politics wrapped up in that. That's uh, yeah, that's that was a, a you know a really interesting thought that uh, Dee raised, and you know you heard it here first. Uh, <laughs> there might be a solution sitting right in front of us, um, but with as as you point out, you know the logistical and political layers that need to be addressed in order to to get to that. Type of solution, um, the the there are a whole lot of debates in in you know infrastructure finance about you know what even the importance or significance uh, there may be in actually getting a vote of the people uh, type of initiative as a way to you know provide political um, sort of a political narrative that that really supports that type of uh, decision. So, um, but as you've referenced, there are uh, a number of parallel discussions happening both in the legislature, 
but also in the business community and other um, variant uh, uh, you know, other constituencies and groups about what is the best way to handle Colorado's massive backlog of infrastructure needs for, for transportation. You know, and since Tabor passed in 1992, the state has been relatively unsuccessful having statewide Tabor elections on a tax increase or a debt increase. Uh, on, on the tax side, I think the only taxes that have passed have been the sin taxes on marijuana. Mm -hmm. And on the, the debt side, the voters approved bonds for Great Outdoors Colorado, which were never issued. And of course, the voters approved the trans, uh, but uh, it really failed to approve other bond issues. I think Senator or Governor Owens, uh, you know, as part of the REF-C package, had proposed referendum D, which was a financing uh, package related to the revenues that would be uh, received pursuant to REF-C, and that, that didn't pass. We also tried a water financing at one point that also didn't pass. So uh, getting a statewide ballot issue passed, I think, really requires some leadership and some bipartisanship uh, and support, particularly from the business community, to make that happen. Right. And thinking of those uh, debt measures that did pass, as you pointed out, trans did not include any revenue um, approval that was required from the voters. Um, and so really the only real revenue items that I can think of, D, off the top of my head that passed statewide, uh, as you pointed out, uh, one or two, the, um, were really the REF-C itself, which was a statewide essentially de and which added revenues to the state, though it didn't particularly increase tax rates uh, of any kind. Right. Uh, but and then also the marijuana tax that was created in, in connection with the legalization of and uh, medic medicinal before that. We have a question here that maybe you need to go back and explain what MMD is. Okay, uh, oh yeah. It's not a financing tool. Yeah, think. yeah, so uh, one of the questions was, uh, how can the state use MMD? And, and based on this uh, slide, you'd say, yeah, absolutely, that would be the best one because it presents the lowest interest cost. Um, the, the MMD is really an index or a benchmark uh, against which the other two actual financing tools are measured. So MMD isn't, isn't uh, actually a tool. It's an a index of the lowest cost borrowing available in the tax-exempt bond market for state and local governments. Um, and it's a collection of the highest naturally AAA-rated states, um, which include Virginia, Texas, um, off the top of my head, um, and a couple of other states that have are in that rarefied position of uh, holding the natural highest uh, rate uh, credit rating, uh, which actually at this point, um, when you compare it to the federal government, which historically was always AAA rated, uh, now Standard and Poor's actually even rates the federal government at AA, um, which is below the uh, AA plus, which is below that, that highest credit quality rating. So I hope that clears that up. Um, we certainly invite questions. We've continued to receive questions as we've gone along. Um, we are, are at the conclusion of our, of our formal and prepared remarks. Um, one of the you know, things that I've been thinking about, uh, Dee, with your uh, revelation about the gas tax, um, what are the uh, sort of approaches that, um, you know, some of these uh, sort of innovations and in, what I'll call innovations in public finance, what are the some of the approaches that get used to sort of, you know, pressure test them or battle test them to make sure that, you know, they, you know, that they meet all the, you know, political and legal requirements um, to be able to be used? Yes, uh, I, I think, um, for example, with respect to this gas tax idea, assuming the legislature were willing to do it, I think it's already been tested. Uh, we had the Bridge Enterprise case that held that the faster surcharge is a fee, not a tax. It held that the Bridge Enterprise is, in fact, a government owned business that meets the Tabor qualifications so that the debt could be issued without voter approval. And, and prior to that, there was a Colorado Supreme Court case that held that the 
city of Fort Collins uh, was attempting to impose a transportation fee against all of the developed property within the city. So in other words, Trini, you know, they would send you a bill every month uh, because you own a developed property, you would pay that and they would use that to maintain the street system. Um, that, that Supreme Court held that that was a fee, not a tax. And so those combination of things are what lead me to believe that there would be a way to do something innovative like that. Uh, but again, it's about political will. Yeah, yeah that makes sense. Um, we received uh, another question, um, and this is uh, definitely a D question, but whether the gas tax could be expanded to include non-gas fuels like um, electricity, other energy sources. Interesting uh, concept. Yeah, it is an interesting concept. Um, <laughs> Yes, the question would be where the person is getting their electricity and how they are paying for it, right? So oh. if you pull it into your garage and plug it into the wall, mm -hmm. uh, you know, how does anybody know that that electricity is being used specifically for transportation purposes, as opposed to one of these standalone recharging stations where you could imagine you know, I plug in for two hours and I have to pay not only the cost of electricity plus something on top of it. Yeah, I, it seems to me that could in sure. fact work. Sure. Uh, yeah, and it, it raises a you know a key sort of backdrop, kind of econ macroeconomic issue that's happening with the gas tax, which uh, we are seeing not keep pace with the demands on roads in the state, and a large part of that is because of fuel efficiency of cars, but also the conversion of cars from gas. Uh, you know, powered vehicles to more electric powered vehicles. So as you see more and more hybrid and more and more electric cars on the road, in addition to the gas efficiency that's uh, being uh, improved for cars overall, um, the need uh, to, to purchase fuel is going down for the given amount of population that uses the roads, yet uh, people are still using the roads as much or more. Um, and so that lack of connection between, or that uh, that inverse relationship really to the rep, you know, the predominant revenue source that goes to pay for transportation, you know, maybe stagnating or going down in some cases, but the needs going up, um, you know, continues to to be a vexing challenge. Um, one uh, I think notable example. Um, uh, the state of Oregon uh, experimented with an idea to uh, really charge, rather than charging on fuels, they still do charge on gas tax uh, in Oregon, uh, but, but rather than instituting uh, alternative fuel taxes in addition to those gas taxes, uh, Oregon uh, experimented with an idea of charging people for the vehicle miles that they've traveled. Um, and this involved hooking up a little device to your car that measured how much you drove. And that in turn became um, a, the basis for some type of assessment or fee that um, drivers uh, paid. I, to my knowledge, that has not been turned in. That was uh, initiated as a pilot program to sort of study. To my understanding, that hasn't been expanded as a statewide and a fully functioning sort of way of generating revenues to pay for transportation improvements. But um, but there are other innovations that are certainly being discussed and evaluated along those lines to try and address this disconnect between uh, the use and, and demand for gas, but uh, not keeping up with an, um, infrastructure costs. Yeah, I think that sort of mileage fee is something that other states are considering. And I think you maybe even see that either in the midst of it or about to do it and we're looking for volunteers, <laughs> you do have this concern, that, this privacy concern that some people have that, you know, big, big brother's going to know where I am, how I'm traveling, all that sort of thing. And maybe given the Facebook thing recently, people aren't as interested in, <laughs> in the, that approach, but it, it is a kind of a useful alternative uh, from a revenue raising standpoint and a, maybe a fairness standpoint to the gas tax as a, as a tool. We got a question about, uh, is there a possibility that there would be a ballot major for new resources this year? What are we hearing? And I think the answer to that is yes. Uh, the, there are a number of proposals that have gone through the ballot title setting for a citizen's 
uh, uh, initiative on perhaps a tax increase. Uh, I don't know all the details of which taxes they're talking about, but I think some were income tax based, some were sales tax based, uh, something other than the gas tax as a as a source. Yeah, I would I would say yes. I agree with all the uh, sort of possibilities that that delisted that are currently being evaluated by a range of different groups. Um, I do believe, and I don't know if it made it to title setting, but there was a valuation of potentially a specific ownership tax uh, increase or extension. Um, and so, uh, yeah, lots of ideas. Everybody is, I, I think one of the things we can feel good about is everyone agrees there is a serious need here and needs attention um, and investment by the state. And I think Senate Bill 1, which is currently in the process, would provide some new funding from at least a transfer from the general fund to the state highway fund, but no immediate debt financing tool related to it, but the possibility that if nothing happens at the 2018 election from the citizen-led efforts, that maybe the legislature would refer a trans-like question to the voters in 2019. We, we have a question here, Trini, uh, about uh, do we know where Colorado ranks? Yeah, I, my um, recollection, last time I looked at Dem uh, Colorado compared to the rest of the country, and, and so when I uh, make these comments, I'm talking about obligations of the state itself. Um, Colorado ranks relatively low when you look nationally on as to the amount of debt, uh, both on a total dollar amount and also on a debt per capita basis. Um, there is a one big caveat to that, and that is when you incorporate um, a debt that is also receiving some attention at the legislature and also impacts the credit worthiness of the state, um, Colorado starts to rise in the ranks and starts to look as a little bit more debt burdened. Um, and that debt is the unfunded liability of the uh, Public Employees Retirement Association, PARA. Um, that is, uh, in fact, a debt obligation. <laughs> um, there are future benefits that are owed to uh, current and future retirees and past retirees, and that uh, is a large number. It's, I think, in the $50 billion range um, in total, uh, accumulating all the various divisions of PARA. And uh, when that is factored in, Colorado does start to look as a, a slightly more debt burden um, relative to its peers around the country. The other, uh, and, and that came to a stark reality when uh, Standard & Poor's actually put the state on credit watch in light of the recently growing and uh, growing unfunded liability of the statewide pension um, together with uh, the lack of immediate solutions to rein in that unfunded liability. As I started off by saying the legislature is currently uh, evaluating a number of approaches to uh, reduce that um, that debt position, though it's not a bond like uh, like another type of, of debt. Um, the, the, it can be managed in similar ways. It can be uh, resources can be dedicated to reduce its its uh, significance and um, its costs. So. We've got a question about whether the governor and legislature have discussed changing the gas tax. Um, <clears throat> I'm not aware of any current viable conversation about that. There have been conversations in the past. Uh, several years ago, Gary Kennedy uh, chaired a mission uh, on behalf of Governor Ritter to look at transportation funding and certainly a gas tax was on the table then. But I, no, I don't think anything current. Between, you know. none, none to my knowledge either. Um, the, there was a question uh, whether that para unfunded liability, which is again a debt, not, not a bond per se, but a debt nonetheless, does that increase the cost um, of uh, potential trans issuance? Um, it does if, if uh, Standard & Poor's uh, decides that not enough, either no action or not enough action is taken to um, reduce the cost of that, uh, that para unfunded liability. Um, as, as Standard & Poor's has said, you know, when the credit rating agencies put a, a 
state or local government on Credit Watch, they're basically saying, you know, we're watching closely. We want to make sure you're making progress towards some financial goal. And in this case, it's, it's reducing that para obligation through one of a number of different possibilities. You know, really the possibilities run the gamut from increasing the contributions that are made to re, uh, the payments against that, um, that unfunded liability or even reducing benefits um, that uh, retirees or future retirees expect to, to receive. So a rich conversation happening at the Capitol right now on that as well. Yeah, and um, we've seen some government bankruptcies uh, where the reason they were having financial difficulties was maybe a combination of actual borrowing for capital cost, but also their legacy pension costs and other uh, post-retirement benefit kinds of things. So we've seen that play out in Detroit. Uh, and we're seeing it in Puerto Rico uh, and bankruptcy context, uh, you end up in this battle between retirees and uh, debt holders and, and provision of essential services to citizens. And usually it's Wall Street that loses out to Main Street in the view of the, the bankruptcy judges. Yeah, I'm glad you raised that, uh, Dee, because that becomes the sort of the worst fear that uh, that bond investors have is that uh, too much debt leads to bankruptcy and as a result leads to bondholders losing out in a bankruptcy process relative to, to other obligations on the books of the state. And uh, the only other notable name I'd throw in there because uh, infamy is, uh, you know, earned when uh, when bankruptcy filings occur is uh, San Bernardino right. is another got a question about whether a state value added tax similar to what happens in Europe uh, be uh, feasible. Um, it's certainly a legal possibility, um, but it would require a statewide vote. Imagine good people here at CFI would have some comment on the, the policies uh, behind that. Yeah, I think we would hear a lot uh, about that and um, you know, but that that raises another you know sort of question and issue that is receiving a lot of attention, I think, um, which is the the nature of our economy has changed dramatically over the last 15, 20 years, and in particular the amount of online uh, purchases, um, particularly Amazon. Uh, we talked about Jeff Bezos earlier. Um, that is a uh, you know. That is, that might be the kind of scenario or as this economy continues to shift to the extent it does, um, when some uh, alternative taxing uh, approaches may be worth evaluating uh, because uh, as, it, as it is now, um, uh, you know, many purchases on Amazon are not subject to state, uh, state taxes and uh, a lot of that, um, Really, what determines what gets taxed and what doesn't um, is uh, is sort of determined whether rightly or wrongly um, by sellers and by companies themselves in terms of uh, how they comply with various state laws. There is an important case before the U.S. Supreme Court right now uh, involving the question of internet taxation. Uh, chance for the court to reconsider a decision they uh, rendered a few years ago involving the state of South Dakota. taxation get back to, to fairness between those internet merchants and Main Street and that's a that's a really helpful point because as the economy is shifting yeah the, the legal framework in which all of this has to operate is also shifting so. well it's Carol again and I really want to thank um, I really want to thank both, both Trini and Dee for providing this really in, in, interesting discussion for all of us I think the queuing up of the questions at the end about what kind of a tax structure and tax code is going to be best for leading Colorado forward and keeping us, you know, keeping the quality of life and the, and the Colorado way of life going, uh, going for all of us really is the fundamental work um, that we're taking on here at the Colorado Fiscal Institute. 
So please stay tuned um, for the work that we're doing and um, because we're going to be in continuing to inform those kinds of conversations over the next few years. Again, I want to thank Trini and Dee for uh, taking the time I want to, uh, to be with us this morning. I want to thank all of you for participating. And I want to remind all of you if you um, want to go back and hear uh, this again because it was just fabulous. Um, and or you would like to share it with others who you think might benefit. This uh, webinar is, has been recorded and it will be available for you on the Colorado Fiscal Institute website um, pretty much as soon as we're done today. So again, thank you so much and um, stay tuned to uh, the CFI network um, as we continue to have these discussions.